Good morning, everyone. So, so very glad to have you with us this morning. I hope you're doing well and uh, feeling the blessings of God in your life today. I um, want to, to say this. Uh, Laura and I are going to be going on vacation starting tomorrow. We leave for Puerto Vallarta, Mexico uh, early tomorrow morning and we'll be gone for a week. So, uh, you know, but I was just, I was thinking about this and um, how rest has been built into the creation from the beginning. Um, that the Sabbath was, was part of the creation process and God uh, specifically set aside a day that was a day of rest and it's not that God gets tired, right? So, but, but God rested, why? Just to, to put that rhythm into this world. And even you can look around you here in the Shenandoah Valley, almost all the trees lose their leaves during the winter and they are so obviously resting. You can't miss it. Uh, then comes the springtime, they're back at it again. Um, so <laughs> I guess this is our way of saying, yeah, we want to be part of that. Uh, Laura and I are ready for a rest and, uh, looking very forward to it. So I hope you have a blessed week and, uh, we will definitely look forward to seeing you when we get back and, and coming home, but we are also <laughs> looking very forward to being away. I've told people several times this week, I think we're halfway to Mexico already. So anyway, but um, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer together as we begin this. Father, thank you for the many ways you have shown your thoughtfulness to us. And one of those ways, Father, is rest, uh, giving us the nighttime where we can sleep, uh, giving us winter when the earth seems to rest, and giving us a day where we, we take off a day and we rest because following your example. And uh, it's interesting, Father, that you commanded us to do that. And uh, so we just think of your thoughtfulness and your care. Be with us, Lord, today as we worship together in this way. Give us a sense of unity and love for each other and particularly love for you. I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. O oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, Pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise, Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light, It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies how tender, how firm to the end, our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. O oh, tell of His might, O oh, sing of His grace, Whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, His chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, And dark is His path on the wings of the storm. Hosanna, Hosanna, Forever we'll worship the King. Hosanna, Hosanna, Forever we'll worship the King. O oh, man. 
measureless might, incomparable love, the angels delight to sing from above. Let all of creation delight in your ways, with deep adoration all sing to your praise. Hosanna, Hosanna, forever we'll worship the King. 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 Tries to hide 
It trembles at His voice, trembles at His voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. And day to age He stands, and time is in His hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. See how great, how great is our God, how great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great paying attention let me ask all the men out there uh, has, has your wife ever said that to you you know that kind of that are you listening to me where they can they can tell that you're doing that kind of uh-huh 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 and maybe you're looking at something else or you're 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 kind of trying to watch tv while they yeah uh-huh uh-huh yeah oh yeah that's great like, are you paying attention? I don't think you're paying attention, right? Or, you know, we sort of have that belief that, yeah, I can scroll through my phone. I can I can scroll through Facebook. I can be doing, watching, looking on Instagram and things and, and, and pay careful attention to you. Um, no, no. And, and truthfully, I'm just saying this because I'm a man, but women do the same thing. Um, so... We we are in the, the book of Hebrews, and we just started last week, and we are working our way through this beautiful book, um, a book that I love. And um, you remember last week we talked about how God said, you know, I've, I've spoken in many different ways in the past uh, through the prophets, and uh, but now I'm speaking through my son. Well, when we get to chapter 2, he, he starts talking about how you, 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 the need to pay attention to what Jesus said, because if, you, you know, really what I'm saying is you didn't listen to the prophets very well, and that cost you how much more when you don't listen to Jesus. That is absolutely what he's saying. And, um, but I was reading this week in, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 26. You, 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 can, you can turn there if you want, or you can just listen to the story. But in Jeremiah chapter 20, 26, uh, Jeremiah is a prophet, and Jehoiakim, who is the son of Josiah, this is the, one of the kings of Judah, okay? And, and he is the king, and, and God says to Jeremiah, I need you to go prophesy to the people of Judah. The, what what he's what he wanted to do was go to the temple go to the temple and as people are coming through the temple and sort of like if you if you do this for a week you, you'll you'll catch most everybody and you you need to talk to them about and he god even says straight out he says um i want you to say everything i'm saying do not omit a word and he says this perhaps they will listen and each will turn from their evil ways. Then I will relent re and not inflict on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil that they have done. So he sends Jeremiah to go, go talk, try again, Jeremiah. And you, and I, I, and I guarantee you, Jeremiah is like, oh God, they don't listen. And um, God, God knows, God knows. I know they don't listen. Um, he says later, if 
you need to say this to me. If they do not listen to the words of my servants and prophets, whom I have sent to you again and again, though you have not listened. And so God knows this. But, but Jeremiah, you need to tell them that if they don't listen, that I'm going to destroy this temple. And I am going to, I am going to punish them. So Jeremiah does. So he goes and he preaches this message, which again, going back to Hebrews chapter one, this is what God is talking about, that I have spoken to you in many various ways through the prophets. Um, so when he goes and does this, uh, the priests and the prophets and, and the people, they heard Jeremiah. And, and as soon as they did, they're like, arrest Jeremiah, get him that he he needs to die can you imagine being the prophet standing up there speaking the words of god the words that god had told you to tell them and their reaction is kill him we're gonna arrest him he how dare you speak bad about this temple the temple of god <laughs> and so that's that's how they reacted and you know um Jeremiah, you know, said, you know, well, listen, you know, I said the words that God told me to say, y'all, y'all do what you got to do. But I'm just going to tell you, if you kill me, you have killed an innocent man. And later, some of the officials kind of, they kind of came to their senses. And it was like, you know, there, there's been other, you know, this has happened in the past where prophets have prophesied. And did the kings kill those prophets? No. And so, you know, maybe maybe we need to, let's don't kill Jeremiah. And that's kind of what they decided. Although there was another prophet that had prophesied the same things that Jeremiah was pro prophesying, Uriah. And Jehoiakim, who is the king now, did kill him. He escaped to Egypt and, and Jehoiakim sent some people down there, go find him. And they dragged him back to Jerusalem and they killed him. So, I mean, this is what this is what Jeremiah is facing. And this is a story where we can see God is trying to speak to his people, but they don't listen. And that's what the Hebrew writer is saying. And so when we get to chapter two, I really believe that this this story is still relevant, that even though this is God is talking about the past and and what I'm showing you in Jeremiah chapter 26 is the past it's still relevant. God's people still sometimes just will not listen to him and, and might attack the person who is actually bringing the words of God. So that brings us to Hebrews chapter 2. The writer writes this, we must pay the most careful attention therefore to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will so you can you can hear what god is saying i think this is this is this is not hard to understand and what god is talking about jesus christ when he says the lord he means jesus christ and that jesus christ brought this salvation it is a message of salvation not a message of okay here's the things you need to do we're talking about the totality of what jesus brought and the relationship that jesus offered the relationship of, of love and indwelling of the Holy Spirit and indwelling of God in us. That's all part of this. And that's what Jesus offered. And you can listen to it or you cannot listen to it. But what this writer is saying is, if, if God reacted so strongly in the Old Testament, when people would not listen to Moses, and the law of Moses. And as the prophets tried to call them back to that, and they just, they rebelled against that. That received punishment. What, what I read to you out of Jeremiah chapter 26, if, if, you, if you read through the rest of that book of Jeremiah, great punishment absolutely came to Judah. 
they were absolutely punished. In many ways, they were wiped out because of that. And it was, it was harsh and it was hard on them. That's, that's what he's talking about. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. He's talking about the apostles. They confirmed the, 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 the message of the gospel, the, the saving message of the gospel, that message of relationship with God, that, that, that message of reconciliation between us and God and between us and, and, and ourselves. And he says, God also testified to it some of the signs and wonders, the various miracles that we read about in the New Testament that confirm that, yes, this is true. Yes, this is from God. Yes, this is real. And he distributed gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will as he was, as he was establishing this is real. This is true. And so going back to verse 1, he says, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. And this is absolutely one of the things that they're dealing with in the book of Hebrews, is people drifting away. Where it just kind of, I guess enough time has gone by. Maybe they've kind of gotten tired of this. Maybe they've kind of gotten bored of it. Maybe there's this sort of feeling of, you know, maybe we should go back to, to what we were before. And... and and the writer is saying, don't, don't go back. Why would you go back? Jesus Christ brought this to you and it's beautiful and it's wonderful. This drifting, the word drift in, in the Greek is actually a technical term. It, it has to do with boats, boats being anchored, you know, to the, to the bottom of the, of the, of the lake or the the sea, wherever they are, so that they, they, they'll still be there in the morning. You know, um, you know, I used to work at a camp in South Carolina, and one of the things that campers always found to be real funny um, was to, you know, to take some of the boats and take them out to the middle of the lake and anchor them there, and or even even sometimes just unanchor, untie them so that they drift out, and that's always really funny, you know. Kind of, they just just couldn't wait till you wake up in the morning and there's the boat in the middle of the lake, and it's like, yeah, you know, I guess we're gonna have to take a boat out there um, and go get it, you know. It just, to them, that was just all a big, that was a big laugh, and actually, I don't know, it was kind of funny, um, but you know, if that's a real boat. If, if you have a boat and, and you've, you've got it, you know, tied to the dock and, and you come out, you know, after supper and the boat's gone and you can kind of see that it's way out there in the lake, that's not funny. And, you know, if we're talking ships or sailboats or whatever we're talking about, in reality, it's not funny. And, and it, it's not funny what, what Jesus is talking about, you know. Um, there's a lot of things that in fake are funny. You know, you, I, don't know you, I, I like the Three Stooges. And they're always bonking each other on the head and, you know, poking each other in the eyes and getting hit by, you know, unbelievable things in the head, you know. And that's, I, I personally think it's hilarious. I, I think it's funny. But in real life, getting hit by that stuff, that's not funny. It wouldn't be funny at all. Uh, you know, getting, in the, getting hit in the head with a sledgehammer, how is that funny? It's only funny when the Three Stooges do it. And as it's, this is what we're talking about. What the Hebrew writer is addressing is not funny. And when people drift away, and when, when life has a way of, of pulling people apart, this is the reason, this is what I want to talk about today. And, and, I, and I really want to talk about it kind of at length. The, the truth is we live in a very dangerous world where people are, are pulled away. People are pulled apart. People can drift away. We, we, can, we can lose attention, stop watching God, take our eyes off of Jesus, and just don't think about him. And you, you cannot think about Jesus if you want for a year. You can not think about God for a decade if you would like. And you, and you drift away. And life becomes extremely dangerous, even though you don't realize it. And that's what he's trying to warn them of. You know, let's be specific here. Wives, women, 
Do you realize that your husband lives in a dangerous world? He operates when he goes to work in the morning, assuming your husband goes to work in the morning. He is in a dangerous world. There are forces there trying to get him, trying to destroy him, trying to destroy you. You, 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 know, you know I'm telling the truth. This, this is true. So pay attention. Pay, pay attention, women. Pay attention to the needs in, 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 of your husband. It matters. It really does matter. And husbands, men, let me talk to you. Your wife lives in a dangerous world too. And, and she is moving when, when, when she goes to work or, or uh, if, if maybe she's at a stage in her life where she's focused almost entirely upon the children. All of that can, can, get, can get burdensome to her. And, 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 if, and Satan works at that and he's working against her. Men, do you realize that? That your wife also moves in a dangerous world. And I just, so many women when they are cons, you know, consumed because they really need to be with the needs of the children. How many women have I heard say, I haven't had an adult conversation all day long. I just want an adult conversation. And her husband comes home and he's tired. He doesn't feel like talking. It's, husbands, pay attention. Pay attention to the needs of your wife. Women are so easy to take for granted because they are strong and they are very adaptable. But men, don't do it. Do not take them for granted because we all live in a dangerous world. And there's dangerous forces out there. Pay attention. Parents, your children are growing up in a dangerous world. They are, and you know that. And there are times in their lives when we can protect them from that. And in a way, in, in a sense, we can shelter them from that. But you can't do it forever. You cannot shelter them all of their life. There's, there's, there's nothing you can do that, that is going to guarantee that nothing can happen to them. There, there's no car you can buy. There's, there's, there, there, there's, there's nothing. They, they are growing up in a dangerous world. And so we've got to pay attention to this. Pay attention to their needs because their needs matter. Grandparents, okay? I, I'm a new grandparent. I've been a grandparent now for th just over three years. But your grandchildren are growing up in a dangerous world. And you know that. And as a, as a grandparent, you, you can't miss that your grandchildren are growing up in a different world than you grew up in. And they are entertain themselves in different ways than you did. And sometimes you can bemoan and kind of um, in a nostalgic way that they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't play jacks. They don't play hopscotch. Uh, maybe they do, maybe they don't. They don't go out and play like, like you did. Um, they don't take cans and put a string in between them and supposedly they've, that's their walkie-talkie. They don't do those kinds of things anymore. But the truth of the matter is that's all nostalgia. But your grandchildren are growing up in a dangerous world, so pay attention. That's what the Hebrew writer is saying. We have got to pay attention because we all are swimming in dangerous waters, okay? So... What I really want to spend our time talking about is what can we do about this? What can we do? I, I realize, you know, I think women realize their husbands are, live in a dangerous world and husbands, yeah, maybe they do or maybe they don't realize it, but it's true. And parents absolutely understand and grandparents are also understanding this. So the church is operating and living and, and being the light of the world in a very dark and dangerous world. So what can we do about this? So I want to talk about this kind of in, in two different ways. One of the ways is, what can you do about it personally? Okay, what can I do about it personally? If I'm going to pay attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so you do not drift away, because drifting away is horrible, okay? So what can I personally do about that? Okay, well, here's... Here's what I believe is number one, stay close to God. 
in all of this, in all of the things I'm going to talk about today, I truly believe that the answer is Jesus Christ. People need Jesus Christ. Your children, grandchildren, wife, husband, friends, co-workers, they need Jesus Christ himself. That is the salvation that Jesus brought, and people need that. Not just to be able to move into a, into a, 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 a saved state where when this life is over, they're going to go to heaven, but where they, they have a relationship with Jesus Christ that is, that is personal and is deep and is real and is inside of them, where the indwelling of the Holy Spirit takes place. Two weeks ago, I preached on the inner nature of Christianity in our relationship with God. That's what I'm talking about here too. Stay close to God is the first thing I would say that personally we can do, that you can do personally. Everyone needs this from you. Everyone in your circle that uh, of any of these people that I would mention, every single one of them needs you to stay close to God. Being spiritually reckless helps no one. No one is helped. I would say the same thing to being spiritually lazy. Men, let, let's face it, but women, I think you can do this too. We can become very spiritually lazy. Sometimes it's because we are so tired from, you know, the trappings of this world. We, we have to work hard and we, we're trying to make ends meet. And, and, and sometimes that's harder than other times. And sometimes we're more successful than, than other times. But um, sometimes you feel like you've used all your energy and you have none left at the end of the day. There's no spiritual energy for any spiritual time. But I'm just telling you, you've got to stay close to God because being spiritually reckless or being spiritually lazy, it, it, that helps nobody. Nobody is helped by that. We all need the people around us to be close to God. Personally, what can you do? Stay close to God. Secondly, we have got to actively watch out for one another. This is true in your home. It's true in your neighborhood. It's true in your church. Inside the church, people have got to actively watch out for one another. Not just kind of willy-nilly and, and whatever. You need to be actively doing this. We are told in this same book that we, are, we will get to when we get to chapter 3. But we are told, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Actively watch out for one another. One of the things I've learned through, through, my, through my life is don't take faith for granted. Don't just assume, oh, 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 he's strong, she's strong. Do not take their faith for granted. You need to watch out for them. Peter writes this, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That was true then, it's true today. We have an enemy in this world. It's God's enemy. It, 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 it's, it's the very being that just can't stand God, hates everything about him. And that enemy is prowling around looking for somebody to devour. That's the dangerous world that I was talking about. And he is saying you have got to pay attention. You have got to pay attention to each other. You know, when you drive, do you pay attention? How well are you at paying attention when you're driving? And you know, you, we all do things while we're driving that kind of not paying that close of attention, right? It, it, admit it, because I know, I know it's true. <laughs> I know it's true for all of us. Um, but, but one thing in particular is texting, driving and texting. Driving and texting causes 1.6 million accidents a year in the United States of America, in our country. 1.6 million accidents every year. And 6,000 deaths. 
That's a lot of people being killed because they're not paying attention. Now, now I know that's not you, right? Of course not. That's not you. And every person would say, oh, no, you should never text and drive. I would never do that. You know, it's a little bit like McDonald's. <laughs> uh, Jim Gaffigan talks about everybody says, oh, I would never eat at McDonald's. Oh, no, no. Um, and he says, you know, there's billions of people served daily. I think some of you are lying. <laughs> and this is, this is what I know about texting and driving. Um, I, I rode the bus, um, I don't know, maybe a year ago to D.C. from Charlottesville. It's a long story, but we, I had to go to Dulles to get my car. And we had, I had landed in Charlottesville, so I took, took a bus. And driving through traffic in D.C., we kind of got into bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. And I can see down, I can see into people's cars because you're up above them. Do you know how many people were on their phones? Almost all. Almost all of them. Men and women. And you're thinking, oh, you're talking about teenagers. No, I'm not talking about teen. Teenagers have a problem with this, but so do adults. It was, just, it was uncanny to me how many people were absolutely on their phone doing things. Um, this guy is saying, pay attention. And you can say, well, I do pay attention, but I think, I don't know. I don't know that you do. We, we've, this is what he's trying to say to us. I know we all say we're paying attention to each other, but I, I need you to really pay attention to each other in truth. You know, like, like what? Do you know one of the things I really like? I like it when people check up on me. And I, I could name the people to you that do check up on me. I have people that will check on me and just say, hey, how are you doing? Are you doing okay? Um, you're not discouraged, are you? Are you, know, are, are, are you feeling strong? Do, um, is, is any of this getting to you? That, that is so important. This is what I mean by don't take faith for granted. Ask people, are you okay? Um, we have people at this church that are very good at it. Our elders are good at this. And, and praise God that they are. I really believe we all need to share the load. And I know there's people watching this <clears throat> that are not part of this congregation. You too need to be part of this where you would check up on people. And, and, I, and I know you check up on your family and, and that, that, is, that is important. And, and, and fathers particularly, you need to remember, check up on your family. See how they're doing. But, but broaden this because nobody can do it alone. Nobody can do it all. It's, it's impossible. So stay close to God. Actively watch out for one another. Secondly, as a congregation, how do we as a congregation pay attention like the writer is telling us to do? To pay attention, therefore, to what we have heard. How do we do that? How do we help each other do that is really what I'm talking about. First of all, the church must keep up with the forward movement of time. If you are going to see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, then the church has got to keep up with the forward movement of time. This is particularly true for our younger people, but it's not only true for our younger people. It affects our all ages. When the church kind of stops and stops moving and kind of... Um, makes some particular time period in our history sacred. And it, it, all of everything that happened back then was good. And everything that's new is bad. When that happens, it's, it's hard on the church. And it's hard on people. And we put obstacles in people's lives, particularly young people, that are unnecessary. You know, have you been to a movie lately? I mean, maybe because of the pandemic you haven't. But let me tell you something. They're, they're not silent anymore. The day of the silent movies is long gone, right? They're not black and white anymore. They're not. They're in color. Um, they're not only in stereo, but they're in surround sound. There are computer graphics now that, that are creating special effects. The special effects just keep getting better. 
You know, have you watched TV lately? The same is true. It's not the, the, the same old TV that your grandparents watched. It's just not the same. How about your phone? Do, what, does the, what does the word long distance mean? Ask your kids, what is long distance? What's a long distance phone call? They would say, I don't know, I guess. You're phoning somebody that's far away. But there's, they really, they don't know what you mean by long distance. Do you, you remember you used to couldn't make phone calls in the day? You know, a long distance phone calls we made at night because, because it was cheaper. Does, any, does, does anybody under the age of, I don't know, 30 even know what you're talking about? You can't call it during the daytime, you gotta call it night. What are you talking about? You know, in, in, in cords, the phone cords, what is that? Now here's, here's the thing that is new. Where's the phone? Where's my phone? I lost my phone. I mean, you used to couldn't lose your phone. Just follow the cord, right? There's your phone. It's on the wall. Duh, it's right where I put it. Uh, it never moves anywhere. But now uh, people do, can lose their phones. And I'm, what I'm just trying to say is things have changed. You have changed. And the church must be able to keep up with the forward movement of time. We must not expect younger people to be okay with what we grew up with. That, that, that notion that, well, it was good enough for me, it was good enough for my grandparents, it's good enough for you. That, that's not true. And we must not do that. And it's things like, like songs, classroom material, Bible study material. That has all changed and it is evolving and it's good. It's good that it's changing. There are classic old songs that are, that are beautiful. Uh, Amazing Grace, that's a beautiful old song. But there are new songs. We sang, Austin led a song two weeks ago. Um, and I can't remember the name of the song, but I think it was uh, Precious Lamb of God. Oh my goodness. That was beautiful. If you were here that Sunday, you heard that was right before the Lord's Supper that he, that he led that song. And I, I just, I was amazed. That's a new song and that's beautiful. You know, I mean, when I was a kid, when I, when I told my parents I was, uh, no, 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 this was after I was baptized. After I was baptized, because I kind of sprung that I was going to get baptized on my parents. They didn't know I was going to do it. Um, but my, I remember my mom and dad said, you, you know, um, you need to watch the Jewel Miller film, film strips. So I did. A guy from church came over and showed me the Jewel Miller film strips. Um, I remember I, I could have this a little bit wrong, but I remember it talked about the patriarchal age, the mosaic age, and the Christian age. Do you know I have never, ever heard anybody use those words again? ever just when i watched the jewel miller film strips and now you can talk to kids what's a film strip um you know i think it's fine to be nostalgic and i understand nostalgia but don't expect the same from them don't expect them to to be part of your nostalgia god is modern and he has always been modern god has never got left behind by the times and the church must not either. We're talking about the well-being of our people, particularly our young people. And that leads me to the second thing I want to say. Young people need us to lead them into the world. That's what they need from us. They need adults to lead them into the world. We were told, go into all the world and preach the gospel. The very gospel that the Hebrew writer is saying, you've got to pay attention to. It matters. And that cannot occur in the building. As much as we might want to squeeze all of Christianity into this building, it cannot be done. The mission of this church is not accomplished in here. That's why Jesus said, I need you to go into the world. Go. What are we doing? You know, um, one thing we've done some here, and one thing I, I've sort of been doing for several years is um, doing, 
helping out at schools. Um, you know, at William Perry, we've done mentoring, and I really believe that mentoring is changing the, the, the trajectory of children's lives. Um, but we've also done some work cleaning up there. We just did some last week with the teens. Um, and, and when we were finished, I asked, you know, before we left, because we were going to go over to Rob's and go swim in and eat hamburgers. And I said, you know, before we leave, why did we just do that? And one of them said, to show the community that we love them. Bingo. That is exactly right. You know, and I realized that working at schools, like cleaning up a parking lot and washing windows, um, that might not set the world on fire. Um, and so I would ask, is there something better that we can do? Let's do that. Let's do that. But, but we, young people need us to lead them into the world, and you can't do that in this building. What is your mission space? What is our, where, where, where is our mission? Where is your mission? Where is it focused? Where is it that you are most open to God using you? Do, do you have a place like that? Have you ever thought in those terms? Young people need us to lead them out into the world. Finally, I just wanna say this, we are all looking for something real. Our problems are real. I look at the faces of you and your children. Those are beautiful faces. I look at the faces of my family. Those are beautiful faces. I look at the, the faces of the people that I know in this community that I live and move around. Those are, those are good people and they're, they're, they're people that matter but I also know that they have a lot of problems. In everything I just said, there are a lot of problems. And so Christianity must be real. It cannot just be about a worship service. There has got to be more. There has always been more. And, 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 and when it talks about this salvation that was announced by Jesus Christ, it was more. He wasn't just saying, okay, everybody, we're going to all start meeting at this particular time and having a worship service, and that's what I came here to bring. No, he brought so much more, and we need that so much more. And the church needs to be about that so much more part of that. You know, I just, I, I, I just feel the need to say, you know, in the last few weeks of my life, I have, I have found out all kinds of problems that people are facing. And, and some of them are just, they're unspeakable. They're just, they're really, really hard. And, and you have really, really strong Christians that don't know what to do. And you, you, you have families that are, that are facing all kinds of really, really hard things. And, and, the, and, and I just believe so much that as Christian individuals and as a Christian group, the church, that we must be able to help people with their real problems. Because that's why Jesus Christ came. That is the salvation that he came to announce. It is so much more, I think, sometimes than, 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 than how we portray it. And the church must know this. You must know this. And that's why he says, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. Because the waters that we swim in, the waters that we are boating in, are dangerous waters. So pay attention. Let's, let, let me lead us in a word of prayer. Father, we want to stay close to you. We need to stay close to you. And I so believe deep into my heart, Father, that what this world needs and every problem that I have become aware of in the last months or years, I know the answer is Jesus Christ. I truly believe that. And I pray, Father, that, that as an individual and as a group, we absolutely would be about the salvation that Jesus Christ announced. 
the salvation that involves the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of, of God the Father and, and, and Jesus Christ the Son. That, that very intimate, deep relationship where we live a life with you even now, even as we look forward, Father, to the next life that will be even better. Thank you, Father. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. supper this morning I would like to uh, just share a little bit of thoughts that run through my head every time I partake uh, I can't help but think of the uh, the suffering Jesus went through um, yet I'm sure he knew the promise that was that was there for him but yet it just went to show the human side that uh, Jesus had while he was here on this earth. He, uh, he had the will that, that all of us have, and that's to, to survive and not go through such a, a struggle or a trial. But with that said, before we partake of the bread, uh, which represents his body, Let's bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for your many blessings. And we thank you for this opportunity to gather and remember Christ in this way as he is, as he is commanded. Lord, it's through Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, as we continue with the Lord's Supper, let's bow our heads in prayer for the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. Bow with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for this day. Thank you for the many, many blessings. And thank you for again for the opportunity to, to gather here and, and partake of this fruit of the vine. It's through Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us at our video worship service this morning. Appreciate your participation with us. Thanks again to Alan for an inspirational lesson and uh, thanks to all of you for participating. Uh, <clears throat> I want to remind you that we are back on our Sunday morning uh, worship uh, Bible class and worship service. Uh, starting the first Sunday in July, we will our, our mask mandate will go away. It'll be a strictly voluntary basis. This is in line with the Virginia uh, loosening of restrictions in Virginia. So that'll be kind of another milestone. Another milestone coming our way is on July the 7th on Wednesday night. We will meet together uh, for a all church get together. The uh, young people and, and older adults will be in the auditorium doing some fun activities with Alan. The parents of uh, children will meet with uh, with some of us in the back and we'll talk about how to begin to restart our Wednesday night Bible classes. I hope you will participate in that. It's gonna be a fun night of fellowship and, and activities and we'll have some refreshments at the end as well. We encourage you to be a part of that. Wednesday night, July the 7th. Also, I uh, wanna remember those that are in need of our prayers. Also, there's some sign-up sheets Charles Lee uh, needs rides to dialysis Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and um, we need to mow uh, for Bill and Pat Sipe and for Joan Heinemann. There are sign-up sheets for, for mowing their yard as well. Thanks again for joining us. Let's close with a prayer. Almighty and gracious God, we love you so much. We thank, <clears throat> thank you for blessing us. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your church family. We, we thank you, Father, for, for revealing yourself to us and letting us know how much you love us and care for us and want us to be your children. We pray, Father, that you help us to, to see all the opportunities around us to serve you, to demonstrate your love to our community and to our neighbors and to our family. We pray that you forgive us for the opportunities we overlook and the times that we uh, transgress your, your laws we pray, Father, that you will protect us, that we be with those that are in need of your healing power and your, and your comfort. We pray that you would uh, return us to our uh, normal meeting times and meeting places. It's uh, great that things are starting to loosen up, and we, we pray that we can again be all together very, very soon. We ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth reap
rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me.